Welcome everybody. Um, I'm Judy Clem, and on behalf of the Friends of the Oak Park Conservatory, we're excited to answer your gardening questions tonight with our Get the Dirt program. We created this program to help educate and inspire gardeners to become more confident in their endeavors. So you're in the right place. The Friends of the Oak Park Conservatory is celebrating our 35th anniversary this year. We are a nonprofit organization that was formed after community members successfully came together to save the historic property, the Oak Park Conservatory from demolition. Over the years, the Friends have supported the conservatory with grants to expand the gardens to the east and west of the property, hundreds of volunteers to support events and care of plants in the facility, along with education programs such as this for the community. So um, just a few things, this program is being recorded tonight. So if there's anything that you missed, um, we will provide a recording after the program. Um, we are asking you to use the chat box, but if our group is small enough, we're gonna have people unmute and um, also ask their questions verbally, something that we don't always get to do. And um, I would like to introduce our panelists tonight. Um, we are delighted to have um, two speakers joining us this evening. And um, Sandy Lentz is our first, uh, a gardener since childhood. Sandy has been trained at the University of Illinois Master Gardener Program since 1999. She has served on the initial Oak Park District's Okay, there's one more question that came before. And she, thought she, was served, she served on the board of the Friends of the Oak Park Conservatory with a term as president. See, and currently she is in her third term as an elected commissioner on the board of the Park District of Oak Park serving as president since May of 2019. Welcome, Sandy. And joining oh, yeah. Sandy, one second, joining Sandy, is uh, Don Necrocious, who is an avid gardener and longstanding member also of the Friends of the Oak Park Conservatory. He teaches classes in backyard and worm composting, seed starting, vegetable gardening, and garden tool care, which he taught um, in April this year for our um, organization. He planted his first garden in Valentine's Day in 1972 and has been in love with flowers and vegetable gardening ever since. So welcome to our two panelists. I also wanna introduce Ms. Kayla Chase. She is our membership chair and also a master gardener, and she will manage the chat and the Q&A. And, &A. and um, I just want to thank you all for um, joining us tonight. So we've got a small group and the format will be um, open questions for our um, speakers to answer. And um, I would like to start out with maybe um, some top tips from both Sandy and Don as to, you know, here we are getting into late May, we're finally getting our first rain. Could you each just take a few minutes to warm us up a little bit about some things that we should kind of be keeping an eye on in our gardens at this time? And then um, I will open it up to questions for everybody. Sandy, would you like to go first? Yes, uh, I think one of the things that uh, I'm hearing a lot about is what do I do with my daffodils and my tulips now that the flowers are done? Two things, first deadhead them, cut the dead flower stems off at the base. And then people think, oh, this foliage is gonna look awful. It'll be brown and awful and I'll just cut it back. And the answer to that is don't because that foliage is busy making food and sending it down into the bulb for the next spring's flowers. So grit your teeth, don't look at them, plant some perennials around them if you have to but let those leaves go all the way brown and to the point where they're relatively easy to lift up and uh, get and, and compost. But don't braid them, don't tie them up. Uh, keep those leaves out there because they'll be making uh, wonderful food for your, for your daffodils in particular for next year. Okay, great. What if you wanna move your tulips? Wait. Well, Don and I are gonna have to talk about that. Um, my feeling is if I want to move them, let them die back first, mark where they are. Okay. And then dig, don't, you can do a couple things. You can dig them now, let them dry, plant them in the fall, which is when you would plant new ones. Okay. But if you have them and you know where you want to put them, once they've died back, I would replant them right away. And then you don't have to worry about figuring out where they're going to go or how many you have. Just, I would just get it done. Don, would you do it that way? Yes. Well, um, you know, I'm thinking back to uh, volunteering at the conservatory 
uh, and when the uh, conservatory staff would lift tulips in the various parks throughout the, the park district system, um, if you helped do that lifting, digging and separating and whatnot, you were allowed to take home a bag or two of the tulips. And I think they also uh, gave them away at the conservatory. And when I did that um, for five or six years, I would always bring them home and heal them right in. I'd put them right into spots, uh, figuring that maybe a little bit more photosynthesis would happen. But uh, like, like all tulips, they only last a couple of years, um, unless the, you have the perennial variety, which come back every year. Um, uh, they're almost annuals. So I did not wait. Um, I found that if I'd left some tulips in the bottom of a crock and I found them in the fall, they're probably pretty dried out by that time and had not been cared for like they do in the commercial enterprises. So um, I, I would plant them if I had them. Or, and, and if you want to move them, I, I give it an experiment. You know, a lot of gardening is by gosh and by golly. <laughs> yeah, one by thing golly. Is, if you have a lot of bulbs, uh, you don't want to dig a hole for this one and then a hole for the next one and then a hole for the next one. You get a right. row of little soldiers. Dig a trench. Go down about five or six inches, usually three or four times the, the height of the bulb. Dig a trench and then scatter them, drift them, and then cover them up and maybe give them some bone meal. It's a lot easier and you wind up with a beautiful drift of flowers the next year. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh. Oh my gosh. Okay. My heart is racing. I just love it. Don, do you want to share um, one of your, um, some of your like spring tips again, just to give us a warm up, and then we'll, we'll keep the conversation going. Yeah. Just very quickly about lawn care. Uh, uh, some people cut lawns much too short. So it looks almost like a putting green. In fact, it's best to cut it high at, at, so that when you're finished, it's about three and a half inches, which is generally what the, at least the, the push lawnmower I used was the highest setting for, for the wheels to move the deck up and away from that. And the, the purpose of that is to uh, keep weeds from uh, germinating. Uh, the, the, the longer uh, turf uh, blades shade that out. Uh, the other thing I would say is uh, this is a really good time to sharpen your lawnmower blade, which will do a much better job. Uh, rather than tearing up uh, the, the, uh, the, the blades, it will cut nice and easy. And it's not all that hard to do. I, I, uh, I'm going to feel safe to say, look it up on YouTube. There's multiple versions of how to do something on YouTube. And if you don't know how to do it, and the last thing I'd say about sharpening your lawnmower braid is count your fingers first before you start. So make sure you have the same <laughs> number when you finish. <laughs> well, you end up with some extra bonus. Yeah. I, you know, to switch topics real quickly. Um, I, I think this is a good time to look at your roses. Uh, as I uh, looked at some roses my son had growing uh, on South Kenilworth, uh, aphids were already on them. Um, and so uh, aphids are a real tiny little bug about, oh, I would say five, six times the size of a, of a poppy seed. And they're very easy to treat with. Uh, a strong water spray from a hose knocks them off and they're too stupid to find their way back on. So that, that's, that's the uh, way to deal with it. In general, if you have larger insects bothering your plants, hand pick them off. If they're smaller insects, use a strong water spray. And what about treatments? What about uh, uh, insecticides? Well, I'm gonna mention three chemicals of the sort of, that's not really the right word for what these things are. Neem oil, insecticidal soap, and diatomaceous earth. Uh, neem oil comes from an ornamental uh, Asian tree, and it's great for all kinds of things, including black spot on roses. And I think there's a crab apple question that might be black spot as well. Um, uh, it would be a fair treatment, although I don't, uh, it may be a little tougher to do a whole uh, fruit tree with uh, a hand sprayer of neem oil. Insecticidal soap is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, it's a soap uh, with a little bit of uh, acidity to it that... Uh, controls insects, it's also useful on uh, houseplants. And finally, diatomaceous earth are the, uh, the fossilized uh, bodies of ancient marine animals, diatoms. And if you ever want to, uh, uh, to find beauty in nature, look up what a diatom is. And uh, it, it, it's just gorgeous. Well, there's lots of different shapes for it. It's, it's almost microscopic in size. And when you spread it around as a dust, uh, insects get their little bodies torn open by these real sharp things. So it, uh, it's, it's benign for us, except if you breathe it. You want to be careful about breathing anything. Uh, so um, don't use it on a windy day. Don't stick your nose in the bag and sniff it. Um, 
just be careful about using it. But those three things are will handle most most things that are bothering your garden. Again, uh, neem oil, insecticidal soap, and diatomaceous earth. And those first two, what they do is simply clog the insect's breathing apparatus. And that takes care of them very quickly. The uh, insecticidal soap does the job, the neem oil does the job. And for aphids, uh, if you have ladybugs in the area, you know, wash the aphids off. And as Don says, they're too stupid to come back. But they're also premium ice cream for every um, ladybug in the vicinity. So if you can keep that balance, the ladybugs will keep track of the, uh, of the aphids. And the ladybugs can provide food for the next level up for some birds that eat them. So I love it. OK, yeah. well, should we turn to our questions? I know we've got some that are coming in the chat. Kayla, do you want to um, start with the first ones that came in? And, and let's go from there. And then, um, like I said, we have a small group, so we can certainly open it up for um, additional questions. So you want to start with those, Kayla? Yeah, sure. So there's actually a couple of questions about tomatoes. So um, let's kind of group those together. Um, so what tips do you have for maximizing the production of around three to four tomato plants? Great. Uh, you know, uh, it starts with uh, good tomato varieties, of which there are many. Uh, I, I, I don't want to say thousands, but I think it's safe to say hundreds. And uh, there mm -hmm. are uh, catalogs just dedicated to tomatoes, and it's always fun to plant some new ones. And I think each of us has a favorite, one of which I think is uh, now almost yearly uh, provided in the conservatory plant sale, the Sun Gold, which is a mm. small, orange, delicious tomato. Um, and uh, if you haven't grown it before, uh, do. Uh, tomatoes, of course, need a well-balanced soil um, and uh, regular moisture because, uh, the, as you can understand, the tomato fruit itself is primarily water. Um, uh, uh, the, it begins with planting it in good soil, and it begins by planting the plant deep. So uh, you plant a tomato as deep as you possibly can. Well, you still have branches up above the soil. All of the stems should go underground. Some people even plant it sideways with the stem pointed up so that on the side of the tomato stem are what's called adventitious roots. It'll throw roots into the soil and feed itself and give a much better show. Secondly, um, at this time, uh, as you're growing it, you wanna keep an eye on the main stem and where a branch attaches that's called the leaf axle. It's sort of like your armpit, like if you that. want to think about it like that. <laughs> it's like that. that. Thank you, Sandy. Much less uh, gross. Anyway, in that leaf axle, you'll get a little bit of leafy growth, and that wants to grow another branch and take away the energy from the main plant. So as those begin to develop, those little suckers, you want to pinch them out with your finger and thumbnail. Uh, next, when... Uh, when the, uh, the, the tomato starts to grow and starts to send uh, or begin to develop uh, fruiting blossoms, find the branch where that first fruiting blossom is and take off all the other branch, uh, branches below it. That means all the energy will go up into creating fruit rather than uh, uh, the other branches that you don't need. And it will uh, also allow for the, uh, the plant to open up a little bit and get sun in and help the ripening. Uh, I've practiced in the past picking tomatoes as they begin to ripen up. I know people want to eat the ripest tomato off a of vine, but when I do that, I get more production. It starts to kick out more. Um, and then I think um, uh, a, a fertilizing regimen is what you want to practice as well uh, to get good fruit. And generally, as it's approaching fruiting is when you fertilize, but lightly, not a real heavy fertilizing and not a lot of nitrogen. Nitrogen will give you too much leafy growth. Uh, uh, and so uh, potassium and uh, phosphorus is what you're more interested in. And I think if you, if you were to buy a, uh, uh, a packaged tomato fertilizer, it would control for that. Um, but as, as I'm sure Sandy and I and all the rest of the gardeners would agree, compost is your best bet for that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Although there is a question I want to address now about the uh, NPK of compost at Ream Park or any compost, uh, how much nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium are in there. But Sandy, anything else about tomato production? Um, and one of the interesting, oh, one thing, yeah, the difference between determinate and indeterminate, which you might see on a tag, a determinate tomato is usually a hybrid and it's been bred to produce its fruit just about all at once. 
And if you want to make a big batch of tomato sauce and you want all those tomatoes at the same time, that's the kind of tomato to get. On the other hand, if you're like me and want tomatoes into November, if I can have them, indeterminate tomato plants mean that they continue to grow and continue to produce until the last hard frost really gets them. Uh, Don mentioned the sun golds. They're a favorite of mine as well. They're right close to the edge of my raised bed and very easy for picking. Most of those never get in the house, um, but they are indeterminate. And so I have a kind of trellis device that I use that I put down as soon as the tomato plants go in and it provides some structure for, uh, for those tomato plants, particularly when they get really tall. Uh, just, uh, just a word there. Mm -hmm. The way I remember determinate and indeterminate is to focus on the root terminate. It ends, ends. So a determinate tomato ends its fruiting life, oh, just about late July. In or not determinate will grow and grow and grow. And uh, the Park District used to have a gardener at Cheney Mansion who liked to see how tall he could grow an indeterminate <laughs> tomato. And he got one up to 14 feet one summer. So they'll grow and grow and grow and grow. And actually what you do with those guys is as the cold weather approaches and tomatoes will not set fruit when the temperature drops below 55 degrees, you pinch off the uh, terminal bud, the, the longest shoot at the top of the plant. And that will force the rest of the life into what tomato plants are still there. And of course, the green tomatoes, if they are of any size, can be picked and uh, put away for ripening in a, in a basket in a in a box or whatever. I Some people say wrap them in newspaper, but I found if I wrap 10 tomatoes in newspaper, I don't want to unwrap 10 tomatoes. So I would just put them in a layer with some a piece of newspaper over the top and then another layer so I could just lift up and look at what's ripening. And we often had tomatoes at uh, Thanksgiving in that method. Mm -hmm. Us too. Do you want to hit that um, heirloom question that came in first? Mm. Can you remind us yeah. of what that one was? Yeah, so um, are heirloom tomatoes worth the effort? Sandy, Don, you, you, want to, to, you, you want to take Sandy. that? Well, I, you know, I said before, we all have varieties that we like, and, and uh, um, most of us would say at least one is an heirloom tomato. Uh, Kellogg's Breakfast is one I really like a lot. Um, uh, uh, there's others. The uh, Brandywine is sometimes thought of as, a, as an heirloom. The trick about heirlooms is they, they produce beautiful, interesting tomatoes, but not as many in, in general. Uh, there are some that are very productive, but uh, the very productive heirlooms uh, don't seem to be as flavorful as the, the, the fewer uh, fruit, fruiting varieties. Uh, so are they worth the trouble? Absolutely. But I would also uh, consider a hybrid. Uh, if you're really looking for, for large production and vigor, uh, hybrid plants are, are great science and, and uh, delicious. So um, yeah, I, I wouldn't begin to tell you what variety you would like to grow. Uh, but uh, let me let me just pull the audience here a little bit. Just say the name of the, your favorite tomato. How about that, Judy? Let's start with you. I am trying some new varieties that I got from Lissa, the tomato lady, this year, and I um, purchased way too many plants from her. Um, I she had a list of about fifty different um, varieties. I don't know if anybody else has bought from Lissa before, but. Um, I went based on the name and the description. So there were some Russian varieties that sounded mm -hmm. interesting. Um, there's a Tigerella one. There's a tie-dye one that I thought I planted at the Temple Garden that sounded like would be fun for the kids. Um, I, you know, I can't say that I, I there's so many varieties. I, I, I love tomatoes and I love to learn how to grow them better. Um, I continuously mess up, but this year um, I will mention um, Ken, um, remember when we were talking with D Dwayne um, Dupree, he actually, do you know him, Don? Yes, Dwayne? I do. Good yeah, guy. I do too. I can ask <laughs> so, guy, I think. Yeah, so he uh, was working the plant sale last week and he advised me um, to get um, 10 foot conduit poles. And I literally went to Ace Hardware and um, got conduit poles and we put them in at the um, raised bed garden at the temple. And I'm just gonna tie the tomatoes all indeterminate up and up and up and up. And I'm gonna see, he had maybe eight foot high tomato. He showed me a picture of these tomatoes he was growing and I've wanted to grow them vertically there. So um, 
so I had literally had temple um, volunteers with me on Sunday and uh, we were this these giant poles in the ground. This reminds me of the name of that book, the $64 tomato. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. Three dollars a piece. Yeah. Kayla, how about you? Um, honestly, I'm, I'm kind of like Judy this year. I like bought a whole bunch of seeds online and, and I'll see which ones I like the best. I mean, I always like the, the beefsteak the ones, happens. but other than that, I'm, I'm I feel like I'm a free agent. I'm a free tomato agent. Okay. Wow. Ken? I do have a comment about um, tomato choices. Given that <clears throat> I just planted my first tomato yesterday in the garden, given that every year we worry about the frost and the cold and this and that. And, you know, we don't plant our tomatoes ever much before the end of May. So therefore my approach, our approach, Sue and my approach is to buy tomato varieties that might not be quite as tasty and exotic, but they have, uh, they're early. There are six, 60 days from seed to fruit. And that way you'll have tomatoes in July, probably the latter part of July. And if they're indeterminate um, uh, early, early type tomatoes, you'll have tomatoes from July until they stop producing with the cold weather. We, we've always grown early girl, but now I'm, when I look in the catalogs, there's all kinds of these 60 day tomatoes that you can mm -hmm. get and they all say that they're huge and they're delicious and they're wonderful. And so I don't know whether early girl remains our best choice, but we do early girl always and then try other things, one or two of them every year to see whether we can do better. Ellen, how about you? But the fast, the fast production, I think, is really important because here in relatively cold uh, northern Midwest, uh, you know, you got you want to get your production going as quick as you can. You know, the one thing I'd say about that is if you have a microclimate around your house, a south-facing wall, uh, a place protected from the wind. Um, that might accelerate things. Some people also warm the soil with a black plastic cover earlier in the season to get the soil up to a temperature that the uh, tomato roots like. And you can actually stunt tomatoes by putting them in too early. They don't like cold soil. Uh, what's cold, anything under 55 degrees. And how do you know? Well, you, you don't want to buy a soil thermometer. It's not worth it. But if you lick your finger and stick it in, it'll give you a pretty good idea of what the soil temperature is. Um, and, um, I, you know, as you were saying that, uh, Ken, it made me think about tomato diseases, of which there are too many. And if you're being uh, prey to them, uh, I think the trick might be to use a, a growing pot of some sort, especially a fabric growing pot that you can put on top of concrete or asphalt uh, or somewhere in a corner. And that using fresh soil and away from where you had grown tomatoes in the past, you will lessen the likelihood of getting some of those uh, diseases that play, prey on tomatoes, although some of them are, are airborne and you really can't prevent them. They're also soil borne. And so it's a really good idea to mulch tomatoes with something that keeps the soil from getting splashed up onto the leaves as you irrigate or when it rains. That's another way that there's a vector for uh, removing the, the uh, pathogens up onto the plant. Um, Ellen, favorite tomato? Um, I always grew up with Early Girl, so I agree with Ken. They're yummy. Um, I also like Sun Gold, which mm. are very good. Yeah. yeah. Eat right off the vine. Can I pipe in for just a minute, Don, on the question of diseases? Um, two things. One of them is that uh, there are lots of tomatoes which are, which are cultivars, which have been developed. And the difference between cultivars and heirlooms isn't that the other tomatoes are natives somehow, but rather that heirlooms are, are varieties, are cultivars that have been grown for a long time. Uh, my dad grew Rutgers tomatoes back east uh, way back when and was always rec recommending Rutgers to me as a very long, long-standing tomato. And I think Early Girls, one of those two that's been around for quite a long time. So those are heirlooms. And sometimes folks that have found that heirlooms are less resistant 
to many of those diseases because the later, the later cultivars have been developed and bred for disease resistance. So then there are those like me who think heirlooms taste better. So I have a couple of heirlooms and I fight the diseases and I have some hybrids which are sturdier, I think. But again, uh, it just all depends on your soil and how much rain and 16 other things over which we mostly don't have any control at all. So I actually wanna build a little bit on this, this um, like pest and disease question um, with, there's actually a question posted um, around pottery mildew. And so the person, uh, Sarah's actually talking about like, what are your, is your take on square footage of, of plants? So what is your take on, on you know, growing a, a raised bed or growing in, in containers or just, you know, um, and, and, and they're saying they get a lot of powdery mildew. And so um, they're thinking about four by four raised beds. So what are your guys' thoughts on that? Sandy? Well, I think powdery mildew is ugly. Um, and it's not super awful for the plants unless you get a, a, a real lot of it. And it's, it's fungal. So one of the things as Don described, uh, pinching out the suckers, the more air circulation you have around the plant in general, the less likely you are to have powdery mildew. Um, and a lot of it depends also, I think, on how much space you actually have and how crowded you wanna make it. Uh, I have a much too small garden, so I tend to have my tomatoes a little closer together than maybe is optimum. But uh, it's powdery mildew, and Don, correct me on this, I think it happens when you have warm, relatively humid days and cooler nights. Is that when that's when, what yes. encourages it? Is that yes. right? And it's airborne, and there are certain plants that are just given to it. So if you grow zinnias, you almost always get powdery mildew. Most members of the cucurbit family, uh, same thing. So uh, if you lilacs grow too. pumpkins or lilacs too, yeah. Oh yeah. So, I mean, in some ways, there's no escaping it. And and for fungal diseases, it, it's hard to treat, almost impossible to treat once it's happening. You sort of have to be prophylactic uh, in terms of, uh, of fungal diseases. And I think I, I may be wrong about this, but I thought a, a sulfur mixture was what you could use on cucurbits to, uh, to prevent powdery mildew. But again, uh, sp spacing plants out so there's more air movement and more sun landing on plants is, uh, is uh, prevention. And, and in terms of raised bed, uh, raised beds are brilliant. And I think if you're driving around Oak Park and peeking into uh, backyards, you see more and more and more of them. And then some of them are wooden and some of them look like you know, corrugated metal stock tanks. Uh, uh, some are those uh, uh, pots I've talked about. Um, uh, I think it's a great idea uh, because you can, uh, you know, there is a book called The Square Foot Garden by Bartholomew. And you can find a copy of that in the Oak Park Library. It's an excellent book about how to space plants in a raised bed garden. Mm -hmm. And uh, also what, what mixes to use. He actually encourages a five different compost mix that's optimal for a raised bed, but you don't have to go crazy like that. Um, uh, but you do have to uh, renovate the soil every year as it, as it does what it does. Um, anyway, yes, hooray for raised beds. I would, I would, uh, I, you know, I always go back in my mind to the, the um, Museum of Science and Industry Smart Home Organic Garden, where we had a couple of raised beds built for us. And wisely, the carpenter put a six inch wide plank all the way around the top of the raised bed so you could sit on it as you reached over and garden from the edge. It's a lot better, especially for um, people uh, as young as I am uh, to, uh, to not distress uh, whatever muscle is left. So uh, it, uh, that's, that's a neat thing about raised beds is, is you can work from all sides. And I think there's one even on, if I'm not mistaken, it's on North, uh, either North Ridgeland or North Oak Park Avenue where they've built it in the shape of a U so you can walk in between the, uh, uh, the edges of the raised bed and work on it. So it, you don't always have to build square, although it's most economical. You just don't wanna use treated wood. Um, uh, you don't have to fill the entire thing with high quality soil. It's really only about 10 to 12 inches where the root, root mass goes. So underneath uh, some people put sand or other materials. Some people even bury cans or styrofoam or packing peanuts or whatever to take up some of that volume. But uh, uh, yes, and, and I believe there's uh, container gardening books 
in the library as well. Uh, and of course, there's lots of online resources. Awesome. So Connie, I see your hand raised. I'm just going to answer, ask a few more questions that are in the chat, um, especially because they're on this, this line of, of pests. So Mark is talking about uh, their grapevine. They're saying the leaves look healthy, but already have holes and what to do with Japanese beetles and removing them. Sandy. Well, I, I have only a few rose bushes. Uh, because I'm not willing to fuss with them, but I have a couple and we get Japanese beetles in June. And the best way to get rid of them is early in the morning while you're walking your garden with your coffee cup, put the cup down, get a bucket or a pail of soapy water and go flick. And they're very slow moving early in the morning and just flick them in a pail of soapy water and dump them down your basement drain. That's the best way. There's not much of anything that we've found that eats them. Um, and they do uh, like roses and, and I have some blackberries that are in the same family and they will eat holes in the leaves. Um, and, but they're only around for probably what, four or five weeks done and yeah. then they're gone. Yeah, they're buggers. <laughs> but they're also, forgive me, they're also pretty. They're coppery and green and just really mm -hmm. attractive, but they will damage the rose foliage and they'll oh. also eat the flowers. So you really don't want them, as I say, just go on. Or if you've got, if you've got a teenager who wants money, um, 10 cents for every one that he flicks into, the, into that bucket and you might get some additional uh, control that way. I think that's a mythic 10 cent teenager, Sandy. I don't think you're gonna buy a kid for a dime anymore. You're going back away there. Uh, and, and for the grape leaf fellow, I, you know, uh, there's this notion called integrated pest management where you don't use chemicals, but rather a, a kind of graduated steps of what to do. And the first one is uh, close examination. So if you're getting holes in your grape leaves, what's making the holes? That's the first thing you have to find out is what it is. And that, that's for all of us. I think the, you know, a piece of advice at this time of year throughout the gardening year is spend some time just looking at your garden, doing a close examination, making notes, seeing what's going on. And you can catch things early. Um, the, uh, in, in terms of integrated pest management, after you figure out that something's happening, the next thing you do is ask yourself the question, does it matter? Do is I care? Funny? Do I care? Is it so much trouble or so destructive that I have to do anything? And then you work your way towards up the least damaging uh, uh, approach, which is often mechanical, like Sandy's saying, uh, picking off, flicking off uh, the damaging insects. Uh, and that's uh, uh, the next would be to use some kind of um, predatory insect, some uh, 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 little critter that will bother the bad guys, uh, which is why we don't kill hornets and wasps. They're, they're what they prey on are the things we want preyed on. So unless they're dangerous to you, leave them alone. They're going after flies and mosquitoes. Um, they're our friends. If you have ever seen a green tomato hornworm, big, fat, bright green critters that if you didn't like bugs when you were a kid would scare the daylights out of you. But if you see one on your tomatoes, with a bunch of little white things sticking up, walk away because that horn room is being eaten alive from the inside. Yeah, there's it, gets a wasp, a little, uh, it gets uh, a little gross, but uh, yeah. those predatory wasps lay their eggs in the hornworm and their uh, larvae come out and eat the hornworm. It's called a hornworm because on its posterior, it's got a little horn sticking up, which is flexible, pliable. It's not going to sting you. And you do want to find it before it does its thing, because I've actually seen a tomato plant completely defoliated in one night by hornworm. Yeah. They're really very, very predatory on uh, chewing leaves. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, that's a brachnid wasp that uh, lays its eggs on the hornworm, the hatch and feed uh, inside the worm. And it, it, it's, it's a beautiful, uh, I, I, how do I say it? A symbiotic relationship between uh, you and the wasp uh, with, the, with the eggs and, and the hornworm somewhere in there too. So it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's neat. What about, someone's asking, Tiffany's asking about pests that took down their zucchini plant the past couple of years. Horrors done. Yeah, that would be my guess. But there's a bunch of, there's the cucumber beetle, which will do it as well. It's a little striped. It's green and white, uh, green and yellow striped. You have to kind of look out for it because um, they move through at a certain time. Uh, there can be spider mites, which are 
real tiny little red mites that uh, love to be on the underside of leaves. You have to turn leaves over and you see them. That also is solved with a spray of water. Um, there are some fungal diseases as well, but you'd see that pretty obviously in the effect on the leaves. But as Sandy's saying, there's a stem borer, a little, uh, literally a critter that will drill a hole into the stem of your plant and suck the life's juices out of it. And if you look for that hole, it's generally closer to the root uh, than it is to the end of the vine. You can in excise them out. You can do a little surgery, cut a slit, bring the critter to, uh, to the out of doors. And I like to throw them in the street and listen for the pop as the cars go by. Yeah, uh, um, slugs go that way too. Anyway, um, uh, then you wrap the, uh, wrap the vine up so it heals and uh, you don't have to destroy the whole vine to, to treat with it. But a, a lot of this comes from beginning by examining what, that something's happening. But if you've got a real bad infestation, it could be that it's in the soil now the critters are uh, living there and you may want to take a year or two off from growing that whole family of plants. This goes back to uh, plant rotation, which is hard to do in small suburban gardens, but in some cases it's really necessary if you want to try to grow those plants. Or as Don suggested, uh, big pots. You can trellis the cucumbers and have them so you can just reach for them off your porch if you're growing them in a big pot and you have a little less to worry about because you've got some control over the soil that you're putting, you're planting your cucumbers in. Yes. And then we have a lot of questions, Kayla. We're working our way through the list still. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, so I know you briefly touched on this a little bit, talking about the crab apple trees in someone's backyard, in Elizabeth's backyard. They're, should they spray them with something now so they don't get that black fungus dots on the leaves this year? If so, um, what should they spray? And you know, when should they do it? Uh, you know, apples, commercial apples have uh, dozens of sprays per year to keep them from insects. For some reason, the apple family really is attractive to all kinds of insects. Um, there is um, a, uh, a late winter regimen of using a, uh, an oil on the stem of the tree to suffocate the insects that are hidden in the bark. And then uh, uh, it, it certainly is pre-emergent and it is not a lethal or, or poisonous or anything. Um, but yeah, I, in, in terms of black spot, uh, I, again, neem oil would be great. You can get a 1% solution of neem oil in a mm -hmm. concentrate that you would dilute in water and uh, you'd re need a relatively large sprayer. I don't, I don't think a hand operated sprayer will do. You'd need something larger than that to treat a whole apple tree. Uh, it depends on the year too. You know, some years are um, more humid than others uh, at certain times when the, the, the fungus likes to visit uh, and it's, it's tough to deal with. Again, uh, prophylaxis is much better than trying to, to treat it after, after it's occurred. Sanitation is something that's always recommended for, for crab apples. There's a crab apple rust too that can defoliate crab apple trees uh, early in the summer. And the key thing is to take up all those damaged leaves from out, out from underneath the tree and get all of them if you possibly can, because they are, they're the ones that have the fungal spores in them and then they will go in the ground and then they'll be back next year. Yeah. So that's true also of rose leaves that have black spot on them. Don't leave them on the ground around your plant. And uh, while we're saying that's true of tomatoes too, you should mm -hmm. clean up all tomato leavings at the end of the season the fallen little ones, the leaves, the stems, all that should be trashed because again, they can inoculate the soil with uh, whatever uh, bad things have visited them. I like the sanitation thing, Sandy, good for you. Awesome, so let's shift gears a little bit and talk about compost. So Yay. there's a question about how do you know, <laughs> <laughs> I knew you guys would be excited. How do you know if the compost is balanced. So they're specifically asking about the compost for ream, but I think we can make a bigger question altogether is how do we know that our compost, compost is balanced um, with that NKP, you know, the nitrogen. Go ahead. Well, I don't worry about it. I don't think, and Don, you're gonna, you may disagree with me. I don't think there's an easy way for the average gardener to figure that out. And from my perspective, I don't use for terms of fertilizer, I use something called fish emulsion, which is just what it sounds like. It's zicky brown stuff that was once fish and it gets diluted and it doesn't smell awful and it doesn't attract every cat in the neighborhood. But I use that for fertilizer 
and then I, I top dress, that is I use as mulch, uh, the co combination of the compost that I make and the bagged uh, mushroom compost that I get every year. But I don't think, and Don, you may correct me, please, if there's a way to determine whether that compost is balanced or not. I think the answer to that is it just isn't something that the average gardener can do or needs to bother about. I, I agree with you, Sandy. There really is no way to know short of doing a fancy chemical analysis. And basically what you're gonna learn is that it's pretty low in N, P, and K. Uh, what it's high in is microbiological life that will, will engender those other life forms in the soil. Um, you know, I, it, it is a truism. If you wanna be a good gardener, you feed the soil. Uh, mm -hmm. And feeding the soil with uh, inorganic chemicals, whether it's uh, granular or liquid, uh, kills biological life in the soil. It will, the plants really don't know the difference between um, the molecules of nutrients that are being taken up from compost or from, um, uh, from uh, inorganic fertilizers. Although uh, I've said in seminars run by, uh, at, at Master Gardener conferences where uh, without scientific establishment, the, the strong statement is made that compost will buffer imbalances in fertilizer in the soil, as well as repress disease, uh, depressed disease, especially for seed starting, mixing uh, compost in with your soil, the seed starting mix will help keep planting, plant, uh, hardening off disease. I'm sorry, what is it? Damping off disease. Damping off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that kills seedlings at the, at the soil level. Which is when so, your little seedling comes up and then all of a sudden you go down the next morning and it's done this. Yeah, and it's, and it's gone. Yeah. It's rotted and it's gone. So, which I is also a fungal disease, which is why you use sterile seed starting mix instead yeah. of potting soil or something you dug out of your yard. Yeah. The other thing I'd say about compost is the more different kinds of inputs to a compost system, the many different kinds of things you put into your compost, the more likely it is you're going to have a, a wider array of nutrients available. Of course, there's NPK mm -hmm. and then 12 other micronutrients, which if I could remember them, uh, I'd be shocked. Uh, um, <laughs> but uh, the plants need them. Uh, so yes, uh, I know Ken Boyer and I talked, uh, he told me that he makes his compost almost exclusively out of leaves. So he's basically making leaf mold, which uh, I think the, uh, he shares that trait with uh, the Botanic Garden up in Glencoe. They make oodles and boodles of leaf mold because they got a lot, a lot of leaves, but they also have the room and the personnel to do it. It's a perfect amendment for soil. But I like to make a compost out of kitchen waste, um, uh, if I have friends who have chickens, I try to get the, their cleanings out of their coop, uh, rabbit uh, leftovers, <laughs> little pellets, um, uh, anything that is organic. Uh, you know, uh, you might laugh, but cotton, wool, hair, um, uh, all these things will compost. You can compost lots and lots of different kinds of stuff, but... Um, Again, there are things you wouldn't want to, but uh, again, the point is lots of different inputs will give you a better balanced fertilizer. How do you know whether the material at Ream is, uh, is good stuff? Uh, assume it, uh, and then yeah. keep an eye on uh, how the plants are growing. And if they show lack of vigor or maybe yellowing in the leaves or failure to fruit sufficiently, then you need uh, another fertilizing uh, regimen and uh, you can find organic fertilizers. And if you look at the NPK on the side of those organic fertilizers, they're fairly low too. It's the 10, 10, 10 that you can buy at a big box store that'll explode uh, whatever you want. And by the way, uh, adding a couple of cups of 10, 10, 10 to a compost pile will heat it up almost immediately. It's a great pulse of nitrogen that, that gets it working, but it, uh, it can be a little, I don't want to say explosive, but because... Uh, uh, that's uh, Timothy McVeigh's game, I guess. I saw a flicker of, uh, Kayla, of a question about what can I put, and this goes along with the compost, what can I put on bare soil? Yes. Just, yeah. And the answer to that is something that I just learned relatively recently. You can use something called green mulch. You don't need wood chips. You don't need compost. You need little low growing green plants that will cover the soil between and among your taller, your taller plants and completely fill it in. And it looks a little odd at first. 
I have a low growing Canadian anemone that spreads like crazy, has an interesting leaf shape. It grows about six inches tall and it has lovely little white flowers in the spring. Uh, mine are just starting to bloom now, but they're growing in uh, a native patch and underneath my tree peonies, the stems of which are woody and kind of ugly looking. And they're just filling that whole area in. And if I needed to, I can pull them. If I want to, I can just dig them in and add them as additional food to the soil. But you don't need necessarily to have a lot of, of bare space uh, or bare space with compost or, or even with mulch on it. That, that makes me think, um, you know, if you have bare, and I'm assuming it's bare because you've harvested something rather than a high traffic uh, compact, compacted soil near the, the sidewalk or something. If you have a, a, an area available and you have leftover seeds that you don't plan to overwinter or save for next year, you could toss those in. And uh, once they start sprouting, turn them under and there'll be a green manure crop that will really invigor the soil as well. Uh, it just comes to mm -hmm. mind. I just bought five pounds of buckwheat seed and on the outside chance I get busy and open up some, some soil and, and want to repress the, the weeds and, and add uh, tilth to the soil. I did that one year with uh, on both of my raised beds and it got about three, four inches tall and then I just turned it in. Yeah, yeah. So if you have extra buckwheat seeds, I might be willing to uh, to see if I could chisel some out of you. It's a deal. Okay. So why don't we um, ask one more question from the chat, and then um, I will open up um, people's um, mute buttons and ask you to answer some more questions that we haven't been able to get to from the chat. Um, Kayla, is there another one that you want to throw out to our speakers? Yeah, um, th here's one that um, I planted unlabeled blueberries from the farmer's market last year. I didn't get any berries last year. This year I've seen some flowers. Should I pinch them off or are they going to be berries? And then that same question goes for strawberries. Uh, let me, I'll take the strawberry. You can have the blueberry, okay? Nice. <laughs> um, strawberries take a, a, about three years to fully establish. Uh, and so you plant them in a kind of, um, uh, net work, in other words, one every four inches or so. And then as the stolons spread and at their axles drop roots, then you will begin to have a, a setting. There are actually day neutral and, and um, long day strawberry varieties. You might want to look that up and see what that's all about. Uh, I think up here in the north, I think you want day neutral if I have that right. Um, <laughs> And uh, again, they're an acid loving plant. So typically people mulch with things like uh, conifer needles, uh, which are acidic in nature and will repress the weeds. That's uh, growing strawberries. That's often a big problem is uh, the weediness of the patch. It is in all kinds of ways. And let me just open a parenthesis real quickly. Now's a good time to be weeding uh, because the weeds are young. Uh, after a rain like this, the soil will be softer. It's much better to get them when they're little than to try and get them later on. But you want to be careful about getting too close to a plant with a, with a hoe or a claw. You don't want to disturb the, the plant's roots that you're growing. So close that parenthesis. And uh, yeah, strawberries. Sandy? Blueberries. Um, first of all, I have never grown them. So you have to take whatever I say with that in mind. Uh, but what I do know is that blueberries need acid soil and we have alkaline soil in this part of the world. So if it, you know, free advice being worth what you've paid for it, I wouldn't try to grow blueberries here because the soil is wrong. And the old adage about right plant, right place, I think applies here. Uh, if you are bound and determined to grow something that needs acid soil, and we all grow things we're not supposed to grow, uh, people, put them in big half barrels or in you know, enormous pots rather than trying to grow them in the ground and acidify that soil. You can use something called horticultural sulfur, which uh, you can put in with that soil for those blueberries. I can't think of any good reason to pinch them off. See what happens. See if you get some berries this year. I Don, think, what would you yeah, as far as I know, blueberries like a, a need to be pollinated with a cross pollinated a variety. Uh, which is uh, you know not often not available uh, in a big box store purchase. Um, they, if you think about where they grow, they grow on the edges of marshes, sandy marshes. So mm -hmm. they like a water table that's relatively high. 
And again, you know, my sense in Oak Park is we have a pretty droughty summer every year. So I'd be cautious about growing anything that has to be, has to have moist soil all the time, like a blueberry does. Uh, I've killed them several times. I, I know people also in Oak Park who have. Um, and Sandy's absolutely right, the right plant in the right place. People are talking about buying lupines now. It's a beautiful plant with a straight stem and these wonderful, almost orchid-like flowers. And how come we never see any growing around here? Because they're an acid-loving plant. They just don't like it here. Uh, why don't we see birch trees very frequently in the village? Well, there's a sawfly that comes through in April and kills them. Uh, they're also a subclimax species that don't live all that terribly long versus the the kind of urban trees that we have um, in, in Oak Park. So there's reasons why you don't see commonly, and, and you know, that's often the reason why we want to grow something. I've got something you don't have. Well, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, th th just have a good, beautiful garden that you enjoy uh, would be uh, enough without trying to out Jones the Joneses. Okay, that is um, fantastic. I do have a few blueberry shrubs and I would not recommend um, pinching the flowers because that's where the fruit will form. Um, and I am just closely watching them and I will try to amend the soil, but so far I've been lucky. I got mine from Joe's Blues a couple of years ago and um, I think I just added another one that I got from a local greenhouse. So I think, you know, give it a try and see what happens and, and know that you have to amend the soil. Um, but I would not, I would not touch the flowers on them. Why don't we, um, why don't we unmute um, everybody? And um, we had a lot of questions um, that were coming in. And um, I just want to make sure that if you want to make sure your question is answered, let's ask you to unmute and um, talk to Sandy and Don while we have them, if we didn't get to what yeah. you put in the chat. Connie, I would love to hear your question. I you know you've had your hand raised for a bit. So if you'd like to unmute yourself and Hi, Connie. Um, yes, I wanted to ask, um, sometimes there are white looking butterflies in my yard. Are those butterflies or moths? Are they good or bad? Do you own a shotgun? <laughs> a dart gun. Maybe a dart gun. <laughs> uh, cabbage butterflies, right, Don? Yeah. Okay. They're, they're, they love anything in the coal family. So yes. that would be Brussels sprouts, cabbage, um, broccoli uh, kale, and cauliflower. Broccoli okay. and cauliflower. So they're, with the, they're looking to lay eggs. Those eggs will hatch. The worms will come out. Caterpillars will come out and start eating holes like crazy. You can use a dust called seven, yeah. S-E-V-I-N, which is carbaryl, uh, fairly benign stuff. And, and you stop using it at three days before you harvest. Um, oh. Mm -hmm. The other thing is to, uh, you know, uh, pick them off, but that's very hard to do because the green caterpillars are almost invisible. They're real tiny oh. they have to get deep into the leaves. So um, mm -hmm. it's tough to do. But uh, what, if you don't want to use chemicals and you don't want to pick them off when you harvest something, dunk it in salt water for a couple of minutes and that will uh, disturb the, the worms or eat it uh, with extra protein. <laughs> or let the, or hope that the birds will get the caterpillars and feed them to their babies so you have more birds. Right, right, yeah. right, right. Okay. Oh, okay. So you don't want to use a butterfly net and take care of the butterfly. No. Yeah, I think that's very nice. Take them over <laughs> the fence and give them to your neighbor. <laughs> oh. And they will fly back. Put them thank in the garage. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah, That's several like of us training. have struggled with, with those. I've also put up another little like white. Um, one year I put up something else that was white that almost distracted them. And I can't remember what it was. Oh. was some other uh -huh. kind of trick of the eye that I that I put out there. Um, who else who else would like to unmute and ask a question? Um, and if I don't hear voices, we'll just keep going on the chat for a few more minutes here since we have questions. Anybody else want to chime in? Like just us chit chatting. Okay, Ellen. Oh, there's Go ahead, Ellen. Sure. I, um, we now live on the seventh floor. We have a large balcony. It's eight by 14 square feet. However, it's on the northwest corner and we have a terrible time with wind. It will mm. blow pots over. It will do almost mm. anything. All the furniture we have out there is tied to the railing because it blew. Um, so any ideas of what I should put 
on the railing to stop some of the wind. I also have a wonderful raised bed, but I would like to grow something out there. I, I think if you wandered a big box store like a Home Depot or Lowe's and uh, through their fencing area, you might see some uh, relatively uh, open braided material uh, that, that will let sun come through, but also break that wind. It, 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 you're looking for a windbreak. You might also find something online. Uh, that's a tough question because, uh, you know, a strong wind is, is uh, uh, really difficult to deal with. Um, um, Andy, do you have any thoughts? I was thinking the same thing, some kind of mesh that would let, that you can attach on the inside of your, of, of your uh, uh, railings and, and the inside and go all the way down and will help to just break that wind up a little bit. The other option, of course, would be a large arborvitae in an enormous pot, but no the likelihood is that that's <laughs> gonna get blown over too. So that's probably not a good idea. And will last through the winter. Probably not. Yeah. 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 There's a young lady <clears throat> on, on Sarah's. Uh, I'm wondering if she's a gardener and maybe she has a question or she's just interested in listening. You have a question? Yeah. We used um, the undyed paper egg cartons this year to start our seeds mm -hmm. and they sprouted. Um, but when we put them in the ground, we didn't fully remove them, especially for the ones that started to, you know, the roots started to grow through the carton. Um, but we haven't seen a lot of growth now when we put them in the ground around Mother's Day. And I'm not sure if it's just because it's been cold. And I'm it's been cold. Okay. It's, cold. it's been it's been cold. It's really been cold. Um, I usually have things in early. I haven't even planted my peas yet. And I usually put them in in April. But it's the soil, is, as Don said earlier, tomatoes do not like cold, wet feet. And they will not grow if, if the soil's too cold. So better to risk later flowers and later vegetables than have them uh, have them ki uh, be killed, but starting them in those kinds of things is really good. Yeah, I, I, I think that's the, the fibrous egg cartons are perfect rather than the styrofoam ones. I put them in the compost bin, they're a brown. Uh, I put them in my worm bin, the worms love eating those. Mm -hmm. um, and um, you have to be a little bit careful with, with those little uh, seed starting egg carton cells as well as peat pots. If you leave a little segment of that above the soil level, so it's exposed to the air, that acts like a wick and will literally dry out the root ball of what you're growing. So you have to break that off and make sure that that's buried below the soil level. Mm -hmm. and, and in terms of those, both those, uh, the egg carton and the peat pots, you want to keep them fairly wet so that they will decompose relatively quickly. But that's, that's a wonderful um, uh, organic way to start seeds. Uh, uh, yeah, Sarah, if that's your idea, uh, you're well on your way to uh, the cultural future. Thank you for that comment. Um, we did use some cow pots and some of the plants we sold at the plant sale this year, and um, some of mine do have a little bit of the edge sticking up, so I'll have to and keep you gotta that, that off. Laura, mm -hmm. I saw your hand was up. Would you like to um, chime in here? Thanks for being here. Thank you. I was just going to ask, somebody had brought up um, the compost at Rem Pool, or sorry, Rem Park. Um, and if it's gone, is it gone? Or do, like, is there going to be more compost? What's the, um, how often can we go get it? Like, when does it appear? Sandy, do you want to take that question? Well, yeah, it's, uh, we, the park district made a deal with the village and allowed them to put their two um, bins, one for compost and one for mulch, ground up tree pieces, basically, um, in our in, in the edge around um, the park space around by the driveway. Um, the mulch comes when the village chops down things. Uh, I don't know exactly how the compost part of it works, and I'm still trying to find out. I've gotten different answers about whether that compost is just for the people in the village who are in the composting program mm -hmm. or whether it's available for everybody. There's a sign on it that says uh, for Oak Park residents only. So I'm assuming it's for everybody mm -hmm. because there have been some issues with contractors who've come along and said, oh goody, mm -hmm. free compost and they fill up their trucks. And we really mm -hmm. don't want that. So I don't know the exact answer to that, but it, it, it comes and goes. It isn't just, oh, well, there's one dump and then it's gone. I think we've run over there to try to pick some up and it's like, oh, it's not here this week. So yeah. yeah. 
it's uh, it, it gets it was there on Monday of this week. So if you can get over there and, and get some, um, it was being delivered once a week on Mondays into I think mid May. Okay. So it might. Is that might how that be, works, Judy? That's that's what I understand. Yes. So I think it might be. And it's available um, to anybody in the village, not just people who have been in the composting program. Well, I pay to be in the compost program with my neighbor, but I think it's too hard to regulate. It's just, how are they gonna regulate it? So Laura's yeah. here, she's asking, you know. We're, well, we're in the compost program. Okay, yeah, so get over there and get-, we, get Yeah, we, come, we, come, we do, we're, we, mm -hmm. we send our compost out on Mondays, but I have no idea where to get the compost. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> at Green Pool parking lot. So the try mulch. and get, cause I saw it this Monday and the mulch is it's all still there. Stuff. So, okay, another Laura, yeah, thanks I, for um, being here. I mean, Laura, um, as you said, other Laura, would you like to ask okay. your question? Ken, I'm gonna mute you. Hi, Laura. Yeah, can you hear me all right? Yes, Hi. yeah, go right ahead. Perfect. Well, from one Laura to the next, thanks for asking that question because I was curious about that. I think I put that in the chat. Um, and uh, good to know because I had no idea that there would might be more and we um, went to go get some and it was all gone. So good yeah. to know. Um, my question is kind of silly. So we tried yeah. our first attempt at gardening in raised beds last year, first attempt at gardening at all, and got really built really wonderful boxes and filled it with really um, great high quality soil um, and got great local seedlings and nothing grew. Um, it was mm -hmm. all stunted. Little did I know I was being completely silly and didn't put any like fertilizer or compost or anything else in it. So mm. I'm curious now thinking about this year, if there's any recommendations as to what we might do. Um, a lot of things I see online are about kind of amending soil that was um, really great for growing things the year before, but because we seem to have been lacking a whole bunch in the soil last year. Um, are there any recommendations about how we kind of fix this issue? Yeah, Laura, there was a problem, a serious problem last year with some soil that was obtained from a vendor here in Oak Park. And I will not get into the name because it's not really important, but uh, the soil had something in it or lacked something and the plants that grew in it were stunted. And it was, mm -hmm. it was a serious problem. So you may have gotten your soil from them. What, you, oh. what I would recommend um, is just load it up with compost. Um, and when you plant your, your plants in it, um, I would add, uh, so again, I use fish emulsion uh, and dilute some of that and start your plants with that. And then every couple of weeks as they grow, um, add, uh, add a little, again, dilute, not real, not very strong. I always use my fish emulsion at half strength, but I think that may have been your problem and uh, so if you, basically since plants take up the nutrients out of the box and the box has limited soil in it, then when you're going to plant it the next year, you need to add back more nutrients in order to have enough nutrients for the following year. But I think that may have been your problem and I would go ahead and uh, dump some good compost in there and, um, then go ahead and plant and make sure that that your plants have enough uh, enough nutrition. Don? Yeah, I, I agree. I, I hope you were watering on a, on a regular schedule so it got at least yes. a, an inch of water a week. Did you, Laura? Yeah, we were definitely watering regularly. What did the plants look like? Um, I mean, they didn't look any bigger than the seedlings <laughs> that we got the seedlings um, and then we planted them and they didn't die off, which was interesting. They just never really grew. We did end up getting some like um, some liquid fertilizer and spraying that on kind of regularly near the um, where we planted and that did help grow some of them ultimately by but by that point it was pretty late in the season. So we didn't get much growth. How close are you planting the plants together. Um, it depended on the plant, but we were giving them pretty, uh, a pretty good amount of space. I would say, good. Good. um, you know, <laughs> a few, like a foot between. Oh yeah. That's plants. great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's plenty. Yeah. yeah. Um, can I ask a quick follow-up on that? Is that okay? Sure. No extra charge. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I guess in a hurry, um, last weekend we did buy some, um, raised bed soil to kind of add to um and then also some fertilizer and then compost 
do we, would you recommend that we have to mix that in all the way to the depth of the boxes or just like a certain amount, like where the roots would be? I, you know, to mixing it into the top four inches would be plenty. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, actually roots go down, you know, it depends on the plant, uh, but uh, no deeper than about 12 inches, but typically the active root zone is four to six inches, sometimes mm -hmm. deeper than that. If it's too shallow, they, they drought out, they dry out too quickly. Uh, so yes, you do have to stir it in so that, because it's the roots that are feeding the uh, top portion of the plant and they're gonna give you fruits or leaves that you, that you want. So yes, you need a garden fork, uh, so you spread that on the soil, you fork it in like crazy, smooth it off, and then plant. Um, and uh, don't overdo the fertilizer initially. Let the seedlings get started yes. uh, before you fertilize. Otherwise, they'll get wobbly and uh, bend over and whatnot. So you want to, want to let them start for about two weeks before you start with a fertilizing program. Yeah. Sandy's absolutely right. Half, half concentration every, I would say, two to three weeks if you really want to mm -hmm. push those plants growing. And uh, Laura, uh, gardening is a learning experience. That's the part of the joy why all of us do it. Uh, there's not a one of us that isn't surprised by something or shocked by something or disappointed. Or every once in a while, we think <laughs> we're the world's best gardener because you put the right, plant, the right soil and zoom up it came and gave you a gazillion whatevers. Uh, so okay. be patient um, and uh, keep a gardening journal. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, we have a newborn and I'm hoping that by the time she's old enough to actually know, then that's when I'll have been a good gardener. Uh -huh. so Congratulations. I'll... <laughs> Congratulations. You're growing Thank the best you thing so much your help. Yeah. yeah. I wanted to chime in real quickly about uh, uh, compost and mulch. The, the public works will deliver to your parkway in front of your home uh, free uh, mulch. It's chipped wood material from around the village, but it comes in large quantities, six yards or 12 yards, cubic yards yeah. these are, and that's a lot. I mean, a lot, a lot, a lot. So unless you're ready with wheelbarrow and a couple of strong backs to move this where you want, uh, think about it. The other thing about the Public Works Department on their website under tree care and maintenance mm -hmm. is a subcategory called tree inventory which you can click on and find the name of any tree in front of your house or any other house, any other location in the village. So if you want to do a little bit of learning about tree species, tree varieties, uh, it, it's a really neat uh, mm. resource for you. Again, public works, uh, tree care and maintenance, tree inventory, and uh, you'll get to, uh, a little bit of fun learning. Mm -hmm. While you're talking about trees, Don, I have to raise it again. Please don't volcano mulch your trees. Don't build your mulch Hi, around of your tree. Uh, we see it all over. Landscapers do it. Uh, and I guess it's either using up the extra mulch or they don't want to spread it or whatever, but don't do it. It keeps moisture against the trunk of the tree, which encourages all sorts of rot and, and fungal disease. Uh, in the winter, uh, if it's up around your trunk and there's enough of it, You'll see little critters like bulls who will sleep in there and then bite. Ooh. Oh yeah, and then and then bite the bark and wind up killing your tree. And the root systems, Dave, uh, Don talked about adventitious roots. Well, adventitious roots not only turn up on tomato stems, but they also turn up mm -hmm. on the bottoms of trees because oh, here's some brown stuff. I can put my roots out in there. And then all of a sudden there isn't much. So it goes around and around and around and it can strangle your tree. So don't let your landscapers do it. Um, if you have neighbors who have volcano mulched trees, uh, tell them that uh, that's, they will, they're gonna lose their trees and encourage them to take the mulch away. You can even sneak over in the middle of the night and <laughs> scrape it off. I've been known to do that, but I will deny it if someone suggests it. Well, but it's just, it's bad news and we're still seeing it all over the place. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it's unfortunately common. And we're all, you know, everybody's learning, but the landscapers should know better by now. So let me just um, cap us off here with um, a quick thank you to our presenters tonight. Um, I, I don't want to conclude this program because there is so much, so much we want to learn from you and ask you. And it just, this is how we get to be better um, in this, in this world of gardening is we just kind of sponge off of um, people like you and, and test it out and experiment. And so 
Um, that is the fun of it. But I'm so grateful for you both taking your time out um, tonight, um, dialing in from Wisconsin and from Oak Park. Mm -hmm. And um, Miss Kayla is on the road. And thank you guys so much for um, being our Thanks for asking. presenters tonight. Yeah, this, is the, this is always a lot of fun. And gardeners are always learning something new. Somebody once asked me once if my garden was done. <laughs> done. <laughs> done. It's a process. It is and it's process. it's new and never different done. and fun every year. So uh, no, my garden will never be done. <laughs> and that's I was just saying before we um, got live here was that, you know, I feel like my game room is stepping out into the garden. I just I get lost and I don't want to stop. And I, you know, I just I mm -hmm. there's always something to do. And uh, I it's love that a, a great release. So um, we do have some upcoming programs I do want to mention to you. Mm -hmm. um, we have an urban foraging talk that um, Kayla has put together for us. So that is going to be fantastic and fascinating. Mm -hmm. So um, it will just make us again, smarter in our community when we're out and about and we see things and we're curious about them and is it edible? And so um, she will, Nina um, will help us learn about that. It's um, June 3rd. It's another free lecture from the Friends of the Oak Park Conservatory on Zoom. And um, so Nina is coming June 3rd. So please watch for that. We have a, an amazing garden walk coming up that Sue Boyer mm. has worked on for the past 10 years. And um, mm. we partner with the um, Oak Park River Forest Garden Club on a magnificent garden mm. walk in our community. Nine gardens will be on this year. Um, thank God COVID is, you know, kind of seeping back enough so that we can actually be outdoors and enjoy these gardens. Tickets for members um, are discounted and they are also on sale for the public right now. Day of tickets will be more expensive. So buy your tickets now. Um, if you haven't received an email about it from us, you will in the next few days. So just watch for that. And um, we have some wonderful children's programs coming up. Um, the Year of the Butterfly is happening now. We have partnered with uh, about a dozen community um, organizations on um, a proclamation for the Year of the Butterfly. And um, it is just about hope and um, coming out of the cocoon. And so the village of Oak Park adopted a proclamation from the students at Brooks Middle School and um, the park district and the libraries and um, Wonderworks and Trailside Museum. We are partnering with all of these folks and we have a program coming up on June 12th that is free and we're partnering with the Oak Park Public Library and um, check our website to learn more about that. So, um, there's all sorts of things happening and um, we'll send out some emails and put information up on our website. But um, I just wanted to mention a few things and thank you all for joining us tonight. And um, I um, will open it up again. We're, we'll chit chat for five more minutes and then um, we'll, we'll say we'll bid adieu. <laughs> but thank you for joining us. <laughs>